having clarified what aggregation means in the context of consumer theory, now let's go back to our discussion of producer theory and of capital. Suppose you're looking at a fast food restaurant and somebody asks how much capital is being used in this restaurant. Well, first you make a list of the capital equipment. It's things like the the fryers, the chairs, tables, the parking lot, roof. So there are many different kinds of capital goods that, that are used in the restaurant. Now if you wanted to get a measure of one number for how much capital is used in the restaurant, the natural thing to do would be to say that the amount of capital is the price of the friars times the number of friars plus the price of the chairs times the number of chairs plus the price of the tables times the number of tables plus the price of the parking lot times the well maybe not number of parking lot but this uh, maybe the price per square foot of the parking lot times the number of square feet of the parking lot plus the price uh, price of the roof times the the size of the roof and so forth no one would say in answer to the question how much capital is used in a fast food restaurant that the answer is oh well you should weigh the asphalt of the parking lot and you should weigh the ovens and you should weigh the chairs and you should weigh the roof and then you add up all the pounds or kilograms that they weigh nobody would do that the only way to think about the word capital in the context of something like a fast food restaurant is the way we just did. But clearly you can see that what this is is aggregation by value. This is adding up the dollars worth of fryers and the dollars worth of chairs and the dollars worth of tables and the dollars worth of parking lot and the dollars worth of roof and so forth and so on. This aggregation by value, this is what we call scheme two in the previous slide. And what we said in the previous slide is that Scheme 2 had bad properties. Scheme 1 had some bad properties but weren't, wasn't as bad. Scheme 1 was aggregation by weight. But as I said, nobody would think of adding up the, the weight of the asphalt and the weight of the roof and coming up with a weight of capital. And it wouldn't be a good thing to do. But neither is value ag ag aggregation in, in the context that that we're talking about in, in these kind of models. Because what you have is an introduction of prices into the production function. Right? The, the production function here becomes Q equals F of L and K. And K is this. And it's got a whole bunch of prices inside of it. And what that means is that when prices change, the production function is going to change, the isoquants are going to change, but that's not the kind of model that we're talking about. We're talking about a model where the production function is, it just talks about technological possibilities of production. It's engineering. It doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, money. So aggregation by value is a problem. In microeconomics, we don't have to ever aggregate if we don't want to. And I'm going to illustrate that with uh, using the, the problem on the left in just a minute. But uh, let me point out that in macroeconomics, some kind of aggregation is probably necessary. Macroeconomists have a really hard job. They don't have the luxury, as we do in this class, of not analyzing money, capital, credit, and so forth. You might have heard of the um, LM curve in macroeconomics. So L stands for liquidity, so that has to do with credit and money. Certainly macroeconomists talk about things like interest rates. So macroeconomists have 
a lot of difficult things to explain that microeconomists can just ignore. And therefore, there may be very good reasons to be able to say anything in macro that you simplify by using capital aggregation and, uh, and labor aggregation and any other kind of aggregation that you need to do. So you shouldn't complain to your macroeconomics teachers that aggregation is illegitimate. But in microeconomics, there's usually no reason to do it. And so we don't have to. If you do do it, you can get into trouble. Let's move again back to the left-hand part of the board. This problem statement is problematic. Nicholson writes here, the two production functions are Firms don't have two production functions. Firms have one production function. A firm has a production function which describes all of the possibilities that it has open to it for producing output. So it doesn't make sense that a firm has two production functions. Now, the production function that Nicholas and uh, Nicholson <laughs> Uh, is, is, is using is this, q equals f of k and l. By the definition of a function, what that means is that if you know k and you know l, then you know q. So we need to know k and we need to know l and that'll give us q. So what's this stuff? Well that stuff's totally useless. If the production function really is f of k and l uh, equals q, then all we need is k and l, and that's going to give us q, and that's it. So this should be totally unnecessary if the production function is the one that Nicholson s says it is. But now, eliminating the unnecessary things on the left there, the large mowers and the small mowers, now we run into a problem of interpretation. What does the first row of the table mean? You get 8,000 square feet per hour using one la la unit of labor input and two units of capital input measured in number of 24-inch mowers. But as we know from the problem statement, that doesn't really mean two 24-inch mowers. It means one 48-inch mower. If, but what the table says is two 24-inch mowers. And if you had one person and two 24-inch mowers, you're not going to get 8,000 square feet per hour. So the first row of the table is actually wrong because it's attempting to measure one 48-inch mower as two 24-inch mowers, and it's not. They're not the same thing. So we have a description of production here which is wrong. It, it, this doesn't describe the, the situation of the Power Goat Lawn Company. The solution is just to forget about aggregation. The situation is you have output number of 24-inch mowers, number of 48-inch mowers, and labor. You get 8,000 square feet per hour using one 48-inch mower, no 24-inch mowers, and one unit of labor. You get 5,000 square feet per hour using one 24-inch mower, no 48-inch mower, and one unit of labor. This is completely clear. There is no ambiguity. It describes exactly what's going on in the problem statement. But it's not f of k and l. It's q equals f of 24-inch mowers, 48-inch mowers, and labor. So 
you've got three arguments to the production function, not just two arguments. You're not trying to aggregate 24 and 40 inch mowers. And in any case, you know, why over here would a 48 inch mower be twice the 24 inch mowers? Why are you deciding to aggregate by the length of the blade? Um, I'm not saying that's a particularly bad way, but why not aggregate by the um, the width of the mower, the horse, its horsepower, you know, some other characteristic of it. Why is it the the length of the blade? Um, you know, what does it mean to say that a 48 inch mower is two 24 inch mowers? So, all those kinds of difficult questions are completely avoided by simply not aggregating. Just write down what the production function really is in using all the having an entry for each individual input and then there's no problem so the lesson is that in microeconomics at least in microeconomic theory we don't need to aggregate and there's no reason to do it and aggregation is particularly troublesome when it deals with capital because when you talk about capital aggregation you're invariably led to aggregation by value and aggregation by value has problems because it's putting prices into the production function where they don't belong. Now, in applied microeconomics, let's say you're studying consumers, aggregation might have to be done. If you're studying consumer behavior, you might not want to analyze a model with a hundred different things that utility depends on like raisins and bananas, you may want to just have it depend on a few items and or you may only have data on just a few items. So in applied microeconomics you you often see aggregation and as I talked about before in macroeconomics there's, there's aggregation. But in microeconomic theory we don't have to do it and we certainly want to avoid in microeconomic theory any kind of idea that the production function is something other than a simple engineering type of recipe to make physical output from physical inputs. And that's the reason, finally, why I I have gone to, to just talking about production in the sense of water and fertilizer producing corn, because it's a very simple, concrete example and doesn't lead one conceptually astray in the kind of ways that something very aggregate like Q equals F of labor and capital would do.